I'm Carolina Grimberg Gorijo, Human Rights Law and Research Officer at the Jerusalem Institute of Justice. Before we begin our lecture today regarding the barriers of peace in the Israeli Palestinian conflict, I want to tell you shortly about the Jerusalem Institute of Justice. JIJ is a leading legal research institute that strives to uphold human rights in the Middle East and safeguard the legitimate standing of the State of Israel among the nations. Our International Law and Public Diplomacy Department operates both in the international legal and public diplomacy arena. GIJ is proud to hold the most prestigious special consultative status to the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations for our contribution to the protection of human rights. As many of you may remember, in our previous webinar, we discussed the major milestones of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Until today, the previous efforts have not been successful in, in resolving the following three main obstacles to peace. Firstly, settlements and permanent borders. Secondly, refugee status and the right of return. And finally, Jerusalem and the holy sites. For each of these issues, there are two clear clashing narratives contributing to the intractability of the conflict. In today's session, we will explore both sides' position in relation to these issues and seek to understand how the socio-psychological barriers accompanying the conflict have progressively hindered the pursuit of a peaceful solution. With me today is Advocate Uri Morad, Head of the International Law and Public Diplomacy Department at GIJ. Hi Uri. Hi Carolina, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. As you mentioned, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has three main obstacles to peace. The issue of the settlements, the refugees, and the issue of Jerusalem. So why don't we start with settlements and permanent borders? Yes, of course, the, the issue of the borders between Israel and the Palestinians is definitely one of the earliest disagreements in the history of the conflict. In 1947, UN Resolution 181, also known as the Partition Plan, presented a potential solution to the distribution of the land. Let's recall that the British handed over the question of Palestine to the UN, as tensions were rising under their mandate and the British no longer had the will to maintain their colony in the Middle East. Yes, the United Nations created a task force named the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, also known as UNSCO, in order to draw the borders between the two potential states. This special committee, after three months of hearings and serving of the land, decided upon the borders of the two states and recommended that Jerusalem would remain under international status. Now that you mentioned this UN Committee on Palestine, we should also remember that this area received the name Palestine by the Roman Empire. And this is the reason why the British Mandate was actually officially called the British Mandate for Palestine. And that is also why within the United Nations, many bodies use the name of Palestine. Yes, exactly. So the immediate response of the Zionist leaders was to accept the partition plan proposed by the UN. But were they actually completely satisfied with the partition plan? Not necessarily, Carolina. However, after centuries of persecution, discrimination and hatred against the Jewish communities culminating in the Holocaust, the Zionist leadership understood the essential need of having a Jewish state. Another concern was that Jerusalem was given an international status under the partition plan, ignoring the uninterrupted Jewish presence in the city. In that sense, it is also relevant to add that by accepting the terms of the partition plan, the Zionist leaders considered the borders as the starting point rather than a definite delimitation of the state. So Uri, what was the reaction of the Arab side? So the Arab leaders unanimously rejected the plan. They were against the idea of dividing the land that they considered to be as an Arab state. This Arab consensus against the partition plan was expressed in the UN vote of the resolution. Nevertheless, the partition plan was actually adopted by the General Assembly of the UN. And six months later, on the 14th of May of 1948, the independence of the State of Israel was officially declared by David Ben-Gurion. Yes, but as a result of the disagreement regarding the partition plan, the day after Israel's declaration of independence, several Arab states attacked Israel. 
The war lasted for almost one year and it was resulted in an armistice agreement between the newborn state of Israel and Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon and Syria. The war resulted in a new territorial distribution of the land previously controlled by the British Mandate. The West Bank and East Jerusalem, including the Old City, came under Jordanian control, while the Gaza Strip fell under Egyptian control. Israel gained sovereignty over the remaining land. Between 600,000 to 760,000 Palestinians departed, fled, or were expelled from the post-1949 borders of Israel. Yeah, and that is why there are different narratives of the war. While for the Israeli narrative this, consi this is considered the war of independence, the Palestinians call it the Nakba, which in Arabic means the catastrophe. Yes, this reconfiguration of the territory was modified almost 20 years later as a result of the Six-Day War. Yes, the Six-Day War took place in 1967 and transformed the geopolitical landscape of Israel. This war is particularly significant as it led to Israel's seizure of the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and the Sinai Peninsula. This was a defensive war in which Israel defeated the joint armies of Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. Although immediately following the war, Israel offered to return all the acquired territories, aside from East Jerusalem, in exchange for full peace accords, the Arab nations rejected this plan. Only after the Arab-Israeli War of 1973, also known as the Yom Kippur War, did Egypt and Israel sign the peace agreement in 1977 under the sponsorship of the UN President Harry Truman. As an exchange for peace, Israel returned the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt. And that leads us to today's borders, borders drawn by war and diplomacy. Regarding the Gaza Strip, which used, be, which used to be under Egyptian control, Israel decided to unilaterally withdraw from the area, removing all the Jewish settlements there. So Uri, now that you bring that up, let's expand on the so-called Israeli settlement. Yes, great question. In fact, it is directly related to what happened in 1967. After the Six-Day War, settlements began to emerge in certain areas of the West Bank. These settlements were mostly initiated by private individuals, primarily religious Jews, who believe that Judea and Samaria are an integral part of the land of Israel and should be incorporated into the Jewish state. Additionally, some people chose to reside in the settlements due to the lower cost of living compared to inside of Israel. Before we go further into the issue of the settlements, can you quickly define them, Uri? Of course. Israeli settlements are residential developments built in the areas acquired by Israel after the Six-Day War of 1967. The settlements inhabitants are almost entirely integrated by Jewish citizens of Israel. As it happens in many dimensions of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there are voices against the settlements that consider them illegal colonies, while another spectrum inside and outside of Israel views them as a return of the Jewish people to their ancestral land. It is also interesting to note that as part of the Oslo Accords, which were two agreements between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the two parties of the conflict actually initiated a process of peace and one of the elements they dealt with was the settlement. Yes, exactly. In the Oslo Accords, it was agreed that the disputed area of the West Bank would be divided into three areas, A, B and Area C. Area A is under the political and military control of the Palestinian Authority, and its residents are predominantly Arab. This area includes major towns, with the exception of the Jewish Hebron, which is solely controlled by Israel according to the 1997 Hebron Protocol between Israel and the PLO. Area A constitutes about 18% of the land in Judea and Samaria. In Area B, jurisdiction is shared between Israel and the PA. Israel has exclusive authority over the Jewish residents and is responsible for security for both Arab and Jewish inhabitants. The PA has political, administrative and police control over the Arab residents who abide by its laws, pay taxes and receive public services provided by the PA in Area A. The majority of geographic Judea and Samaria, about 60% of the area, falls within Area C where Israel has exclusive administrative and security jurisdiction. 
Most of the settlements are located in Area C. But even if the area was divided as agreed by the two parties, some states, organizations, and even institutions perceive the Israeli presence in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem for this purpose as occupied territories. Based on this logic, they claim that the settlements are illegal under international law. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate more on the international law aspect of these arguments? Yes, of course. So they base this view on many sources of international humanitarian law, and specifically the Fourth Geneva Convention that states the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. They believe that the West Bank is occupied and that the settlements have been built by Israel, and therefore they consider this to constitute transfer of civilian population into the occupied territories. And what is the argument that claims that the settlements are legal? The Israeli government and many experts believe that the Israeli settlements are not illegal. First, the basis for this, for this is that according to this approach, Neither the West Bank nor East Jerusalem are actually occupied territories, but rather territories in dispute. Therefore, the settlements are not considered as transfer of population into an occupied territory. Moreover, Judea and Samaria and East Jerusalem have a historical and religious connection to the Jewish people, a reason why this view refers to them as territories in dispute, as both parties to the conflict argue to have legitimate claims over the land. But even if this matter is decided on, there are still more barriers to peace. Yes, one of them being the highly debated potential right of return to Palestinian refugees. Yes, there are several layers to this issue of refugees. So let's talk about each and every one of them. Can you just give us some background on this issue first? Sure. We should probably start by clarifying that the United Nations defines Palestinian refugees as persons whose normal place of residence was Palestine during the period 1 June 1946 to 15 May 1948, and who lost both home and means of livelihood as a result of the 1948 conflict. Nevertheless, it has established that descendants of Palestinian refugees are also considered refugees themselves, something that does not take place with other refugees groups. And this is the reason why, while after the war, there were around 750,000 Palestinian refugees who fled their homes and relocated in several Arab countries surrounding Israel, now the amount of the Palestinian refugees has increased to 5.9 million. So wait, Uri, you mentioned that several Palestinians moved to Arab countries surrounding Israel. But these countries didn't grant them citizenship. They kept them as refugees. Yes, in Syria and in Lebanon, where half a million Palestinian refugees have not been granted citizenship, even though they are drafted into the Syrian armed forces. These Palestinians are being kept as political tools, as bargaining chips for the Arab states to keep Israel in the tough position. And most of the remaining Palestinian refugees live in Lebanon, the West Bank and Gaza. But even actually if they provided them with citizenship, they maintain their status of refugees. Right, and this population of almost 6 million Palestinians believe that they have the right of return to what is today the state of Israel, and Israel has opposed this claim for several reasons. Yes, for one, if 5 million Palestinians were to return to Israel, Israel would lose its Jewish majority in the population, which is the basis of the identity of the state, as Israel was established as the Jewish and democratic state. And this is the situation in Israel trying to avoid exactly that. And there are two narratives that are dominating this issue, with the Israelis and the Palestinians viewing this in completely different ways. Yeah, the two sides even call the refugee issue different names. The Palestinians refer to their exile after the War of Independence as the Nakba, which translates to the catastrophe. The Israelis have not given it a name, simply referring to it as the issue of the Palestinian refugees. Right. By calling the issue the Nakba, the catastrophe, the Palestinian narrative revolves around how they view their exile as a catastrophic event, one that ruined the lives of millions of Palestinians. The refugee status of the Palestinian people has worked its way into their culture, with Nakba Day observed every year on May 15th. And the Israelis, of course, have their own view on this issue. This conflict is indeed characterized by the different views on each matter. 
The Israelis believe that not all Palestinians were forced out of Israel by the Israeli military. Israel claims that Arab leaders during the War of Independence told their people to flee in order to clear the battlefield between them and Israel, promising the Palestinians that after the war they would be able to return. They also believe that some of the Palestinians left voluntarily, either because of calls from Arab leaders to leave or because of panic and fear. And like so many conflicts, no one can agree on what narrative is more accurate. Right. And these conflicting views on this cause of the refugees issue contribute greatly to the issue of the right of return today. Could you please tell us what are the main concerns, concerns on the issue of the refugees? Yes, the main issue are demography, security, negotiation of the conflict at large, and resettlement in Israel. Each of these aspects has its own narrative from each side and all of them are preventing the possibility of reaching an agreement on the matter of the refugees. Yes, aside from the demographic issue that we discussed before, Israel feels that if they allow 5 million Palestinians to, into the country, there will be great instability and insecurity. Arab leaders and Palestinians are also keeping the issue of refugees alive because it is a big part of the negotiation process for the conflict at large. Arab countries could have easily absorbed the Palestinian people into their borders, but then they would have lost their bargaining power. So for now, it seems like we are in a stalemate with this issue. Israel does not want to lose its Jewish majority. They don't want to take this demographic risk, and they don't believe in the Palestinian right of return. On the other hand, Palestinians want to return to the former British mandate. Now that we've talked about all this issue of the settlements, borders, and refugees, we can turn to the discussion of arguably the most contested city in the world, Jerusalem. Originally designated as an international city by the United Nations in their partition plan, the status of Jerusalem has definitely changed. We should go a bit back on history to understand how we reach today's status quo. Once the British mandate ended in 1948, there was a lack of consensus as to which state Jerusalem would belong to. The three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianism, and Islam, all have most of their holy sites in Jerusalem. Therefore, both the Israeli and the Palestinian national claims over the city have strong religious-based roots. Can you explain to us the arguments both sides made as to why they should have the city? Yes, of course, and I want to start with the Israeli side. Jerusalem is the holiest place for the Jewish people. It is the location of the first and second temples, today the Western Wall, and the ancient city of David. Even before King David made the city the capital of his kingdom 3,000 years ago, Jerusalem has been the focus of Jewish history, the center of Jewish consciousness, religion, and nationhood. Therefore, it is argued that a Jewish state cannot exist without Jerusalem as one of its cities, if not the capital. The modern state of Israel also holds Jerusalem as a vital city. It is the location of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, the Supreme Court, and the office of the Prime Minister. Israel claims its capital as Jerusalem, and this was recently recognized by the United States. Yes, but still, many countries do not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Since the United Nations partition plan made Jerusalem an international city when it originally divided up the British mandate, some argue that Israel is actually acting against international law in its claim of the city. At the same time, this statement is countered by the Jordanian occupation of Jerusalem, which took, took place from 1948 until 1967. Israel argues that if Jordan had control over Jerusalem by aggression, then they set the precedent for Israel to follow suit. And what is the Palestinian argument for why they should have ownership of Jerusalem, or as they call it, Al-Quds? The Palestinians have similar claims as the Israelis. They too have some of the most important religious sites in Jerusalem, including the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. The Al-Aqsa Mosque's significance as the third most important place in Islam strengthens the Palestinian claim over Jerusalem, as it embodies their historical, cultural, and religious ties to the region. Ironically, these sites are located on the Temple Mount in the Old City of Jerusalem, 
which was originally built by King Herod as an expansion of the Second Temple. So the most important Islamic sites in Jerusalem are built on top of Jewish built holy sites. Yes, and this enhances the dispute over Jerusalem. And where does Jerusalem stand in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? The city of Jerusalem presents another issue that has been a stalemate for the conflict. Both Israel and the Palestinians wish to make Jerusalem the capital of, of their state, and neither side is budging. Increasing tensions is the battle between East Jerusalem. Yes, even during times of peace talks, it was almost impossible to find an agreement about Jerusalem. During the Camp David summit in 2000, Israel presented a proposal to Palestinian leaders Yasser Arafat that includes the possibility of Palestinian sovereignty over parts of East Jerusalem, including the Old City. But even then, the Palestinian leadership rejected the proposal, arguing that they did not meet the Palestinian demands for full sovereignty over the entire of Jerusalem, of East Jerusalem, including the Old City, of course. East Jerusalem has been a point of contention for decades. Currently, almost 600,000 people live in East Jerusalem, with 60% being Palestinians and 40% Israelis. So, Uri, to end this talk, let's sum up each of the three barriers to peace. Do you want to start with the issue of the settlements and permanent borders? Sure. The borders between Israel and the Palestinians were drawn after the British Mandate, one of the last colonies of the British Empire, ended, and the United Nations, a relatively new international community, stepped in to divide the region. Yes, they passed a resolution known today as the Partition Plan, which suggested a two-state solution and made Jerusalem an international city. Israel accepted this plan, but the Palestinians rejected it, adhering to calls from several Arab states in the Middle East. The War of Independence followed, where borders were drawn until the Six-Day War of 1967. After this war, new Israeli borders were drawn, which included Gaza, the West Bank, the Golan Heights, and East Jerusalem. Let's remember also that Israel unilaterally withdrew from the Gaza Strip in 2005. Right, but those areas are considered by some as occupied, and the Jewish people living there are settlers, and find the settlements to be illegal. It is also claimed by others that this territory is actually in dispute, and until now, the two sides were not able to agree on how to dispute the land. This land disagreement is one of the main barriers to peace. And what about the issue of the refugees and the right to return? So yes, this is also an issue brought about by war and territorial control. Many Palestinians fled their homes during the War of Independence of 1948. They never assimilated into a surrounding Arab states, but were kept as refugees. Today, there are almost 6 million Palestinian refugees who wish to return to the former British Mandate, and they claim they have the right to return, a claim supported by several countries and institutions as well. Yes, but Israel does not agree with such a view and also has emphasized several reasons for rejecting the return of almost 6 million Palestinians. For one, the influx of Palestinians would overthrow the Jewish majority in Israel, causing a demographic change in the state which would cause the loss of the identity of Israel as a Jewish state. <clears throat> Moreover, Israel is not empty and therefore the Palestinians who claim to hold a right of return would not actually return to where they allegedly live. This issue, being used as a negotiating tactic by Arab states, will not be solved until there is a solution to the conflict at large and will continue to serve as a barrier to peace within the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm -hmm. And finally, what about the issue of Jerusalem and its holy sites? Again, this is an issue related to the connection that both people claim to have to the city. The partition plan suggested that Jerusalem would be considered to have an international status, but this wasn't what happened in reality. Both Israel and the Palestinians view Jerusalem as an integral part of their state. They both claim that Jerusalem to be their capitals, and both people's religions have some of the most important sites in the city. Carolina, it seems like we have a way to go until there is a peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Yes, the barriers to peace are severe and have been made so political with so many sites and international influences that it seems like the situation is at standstill for now. Well, thank you, Carolina, and thank you guys for joining us today. 
and I'm looking forward to our next webinar.